Tonight's theme is igniting innovation, and I want to think a wee bit and reflect a wee bit about making sparks fly and how all of us maybe get involved in doing that. And I suppose that's because I asked the question, well, why is innovation important to us and why are we all here, here tonight? And I think it's because everybody who's sitting here is involved in some way in transformation. That's the business each and every one of us is, and that probably unites us across the room. We're all transforming something. We are all making things better for some reason. And I reflect on George Bernard Shaw, who said that the people who refuse to accept their circumstances and go out and change them are the ones who drive civilization on. So in that sense, innovation is the part of the driver for change, for betterment in, in the world. And when I talk about innovation, I'm not just talking about economic innovation, I'm talking about innovation in everything that we do. And I want to reflect a wee bit about cities and how we ignite innovation in cities and how we make cities better places to live. Because the majority of the world's population now live in cities. And innovative, dynamic cities are really got to be the answer to our problems in the future. And I think we need to be clear what drives innovation in cities. Belfast itself is a great illustration of cities and innovation. Uh, because Belfast was a place that once loved innovation, that it had the formula for innovation. But somewhere along the way, it lost that formula. And like the Titanic, Belfast hit an iceberg at some point. And the question I suppose we need to reflect on and ask ourselves um, in this great city is, did the iceberg make us sink? In terms of this city, this powerful city, 100 years ago, this was a powerhouse. This was an economic powerhouse. This city was the third industrial city of the British Empire after Glasgow and Manchester. Um, it was led at that time um, by a very ambitious corporation who led the world in innovation in terms of engineering, in textiles, and in shipbuilding. That corporation was part of a very British um, municipal dynamism um, where great cities in Britain competed to be the best at that time. The Belfast Corporation knew what made a city successful, and it's a formula that goes on to the present day. Firstly, the corporation exemplified soaring ambition for this city. They had an ability to create a shared vision around that um, ambition. They had a vision for the future, for what Belfast could do. They had imagination, and they were able to galvanize a very broad and very powerful coalition around that imagination and create united leadership in the city. So that was the first thing that they were able to achieve. Secondly, they were able to create wealth. And the corporation in those days was almost entirely made up of businessmen. That's the way the city was run. And each and every one of them knew about production systems. They knew about how to make money. They knew how to develop products. And they also knew how to export them. And Belfast exported products throughout the world. They were a global leader in many things. And thirdly, and importantly, they also knew that cities needed to attract people. And to attract people, cities needed to be attractive. So what did the corporation do about that? Well, if we look through the city of Belfast now, we'll see there's a whole development of parks. Most of the parks in Belfast were developed in the Victorian times, in the 19th century, because the corporation invested in parks to be the breathing lungs of the city. They also invested in gas. They developed the gas works, and they uh, put gas lighting throughout this city. And we were one of the first cities in the British Isles to have street lighting um, controlled by gas. And thirdly, they had the huge imagination to purchase 9,000 acres uh, of land in the middle of the Mourne Mountains, which secured the water uh, for the city right down to this very day. Now, those, when we talk today about capital investments and infrastructure investments, that was serious infrastructural planning at that time. So this was a city that knew what it wanted and knew how to do it. This was a city that understood the levers for economic domination and knew that innovation would drive the city forward. They also knew that education and learning drove innovation. And they knew that they had a school's infrastructure. At that time, I think you left school about 10 or 11. They had a university that had been endowed, Queen's, um, in the middle of the 19th century. But they knew they lacked something. And what they wanted was an establishment that was dedicated to the needs of innovation and linked strongly to industry and to commerce. 
So the Belfast Technical Institute was born, affectionately, to become known as the Tech, and that was a true marriage, that was a paradigm shift in terms of how a city developed itself, because it was a marriage between education, between the city, and between industry. And from the beginning, its job was to train and develop new workers and innovators for the city. And its base was to do research, to develop, to pioneer, to build into its foundations the notion of fusion. The curriculum was broad-based. It didn't recognize boundaries or barriers. And these are pictures of the windows. And on every window, each window, there are 14 of them in the old building. And they're all dedicated to a different discipline. So they were dedicated to physics, to mathematics. Those are obvious. But they were also dedicated to classics, to literature, to art. The first art college was incorporated in the tech. So it was about freely fusing all these different disciplines to work to find new dynamics in the city. And crucially, it was open to all because it didn't cost very much to go to the tech. It was affordable to be there. What the corporation knew was that a love of um, curiosity, that igniting curiosity, would create the climate for the applying of curiosity to the solutions of the problems which the economy threw up. So they knew what they were doing in that old Belfast Corporation. Unfortunately, though, somewhere along the way, battled by two world wars, by depression, and by political difficulties, Belfast lost its mojo. The spark went out, and innovation kind of went to one side. We lost our love of innovation. We forgot how to make it happen. We lost the habit of continually looking and striving and having ambition about who we were and what we wanted to do. Of course, Belfast wasn't on its own, because if we look at the um, other big cities in Britain at that time, then in the 60s and 70s, we see the decline of British industry in a whole range of issues. Shipbuilding died and went to the Far East. Textiles came out from under us, and large parts of the engineering industry, particularly in the north of England, also disappeared. So Belfast wasn't on its own in losing the habit of innovation. It wasn't on its own in not waking up and smelling the coffee and understanding that other economies were working ahead of it. But what Belfast did was that it gave itself a double whammy. And we had a period which we euphemistically refer to here now as the Troubles. And 30 years of violence, of difficulty, um, was our, our legacy in that period. And it's, it's interesting, I think, to note that in a city that once built ships, we now built walls and fences. And that's what we did. Um, we divided ourselves, we segregated this city, and we found ways to separate ourselves and to be different. Fortunately, and finally, um, Belfast began to see that innovation and the habit of innovation might be useful if we brought it back. And I think the peace process for me and again, this is why I'm talking about the loop of innovation. The peace process, I think, can be described as one of the most profoundly innovative processes that the city has ever experienced. Because the peace process brought a situation where the lion literally did lie down with the lamb in this city. And this is a model which is now being widely instituted across the world. People come from across the world to study how we made peace with each other. People from Northern Ireland politicians travel around the world talking to other politicians in troubled spots. So here is an innovation model which again Belfast found and which has been exporting. This is President Clinton actually here um, nearly 14 years ago turning the first sod. There was, there was very little here at that time. But this is the picture of him bringing hope and he presaged the peace process. Belfast is and was able then, I think, to begin to think about innovation again for the first time in decades. Innovation, which is about solving problems, wicked problems. And the question for us, I think, uh, is can Belfast utilize this very long history of innovative problem solving to ignite the city once again and to bring real innovation back here? Winning the peace was a hard process, and it achieved um, wonderful things but it was achieved mostly, I think, through its biggest resource, and that's its people. During the Troubles, people absolutely exhibited innovation when we think about it. Huge ingenuity, great courage, tenacity, spirit, which kept them going. 
They used huge creativity, and anybody who lived in Belfast during the 30 years of the Troubles knows just what I'm talking about. I'm thinking about the use of black taxis, the London black taxi, to turn into a public transport system. All sorts of creativities to get around the city to move and do things. They exhibited perseverance and wit and resilience during that time. They knew as a people, we knew as a people, if it didn't kill you, then it made you stronger. They knew that they had brought about peace, but they also acknowledged that the barriers, the walls, still had to be over overcome. But at least they were talking about those walls. They also knew they had a fantastic asset, and we continue to have that. This is one of the youngest city populations in Europe, and that's a tremendous and magnificent asset for the future. Over the decades since the peace, Belfast has had to learn to do innovation again, and in some areas it has been hugely successful. So reinventing yourself from 30 years of violence as a tourist destination is not the easiest thing to do. It did require massive innovation, but in fact, it's one that Belfast has really pulled off. And there have been a series of other issues which it has been able to achieve in, in moving forward. And it is as a city, I think, beginning to reimagine itself as a powerhouse, as that powerhouse that it used to be. It still knows that it faces many, many challenges, but peacemaking, I think, has become a very powerful metaphor for understanding that you can make sparks fly, good sparks fly, and make changes. And I think one really interesting part of, of the Belfast story is that finally we have come to terms with the Titanic tragedy because we spent, I think, nearly 100 years ignoring the tragedy and pretending that Titanic had nothing to do with this. And of course, you now know that we as Titanic Town have completely embraced it. All right, that being the case and in that atmosphere, what other lessons is the city now learning from the 19th century? I think one of the lessons is the one around learning and curiosity igniting innovation. Here at the Springvale campus, I think we've set out to try again to create the new learning uh, paradigm for this century. In that, the place where we are putting E3 is very, very crucial. It's situated in the middle of the most disadvantaged or some of the most disadvantaged communities in Belfast, and it's on a peace line. A peace line which represents a divide a barrier, it's a wall, it's a division. Yet we've decided to bring that challenge here, to challenge the old, the old ways of doing things and to build something new. E3 for us represents the new neutral. Neutral as a shared space going beyond walls. Neutral as a safe place for thinking, for exploring and for feeling. When people talk about neutral, they tend to think in beige. Well, the new neutral is not beige. The new neutral is multicolored. The new neutral is full of possibility. It's a place where sparks can fly. It's a place which will light productive fires. And I recall Yeats when he said that education isn't the filling of a pail. Education is the lighting of a fire. And that's what we intend to do here. The new neutral doesn't shy away from difference. The new neutral is a place of creative abrasion. It's about recognizing difference. It's about celebrating difference. It's about seeing difference as making us stronger. It's about blurring uh, boundaries in terms of what we can do. And in this, the spatial layout of this building, and I do hope that you go and have a good look tonight as you're wandering, and the technology which this building represents play key roles in allowing us to go beyond walls, even when physically we look out the window and they still remain. Here, we push to be open about what, not bounded by how. As with the old tech, we've pushed away the boundaries and the disciplines. We've liberated ourselves from silos. We intend to go for no frontiers. And our fresh program, which is about problem solving and learning about analytic techniques and working in teams, is very, very much wedded to that concept that there are no single disciplines, that every problem requires different points of view and different disciplines to make it a real solution. Here, the most disadvantaged of the city get to play and learn with the same tools that the most privileged of the city get to play with because we believe everyone in the city is worth it. Here, we intend to look up at the stars, not down at our feet. So we will use this space, we hope, to create that new paradigm and bring that paradigm out radiating across the city.
connecting, electrifying along the neural pathways and the arterial routes of this city. We will make this place attractive. And to many people, they would say to us, that's mad. You know, who would ever think that a Peace Line site would be attractive? But we will make it attractive. We will bring visitors here and we will export the communities here out with their courage and their tenacity. All right, so we work here again to bring back the dynamism of the 19th century Belfast. But we want to do it slightly differently, maybe because the, the wealth of Belfast and creating wealth in Belfast tended to be created for one, one sector of the city. So now we want to create wealth that includes all of the city. Now we want to provide an attractive city across all communities in the city. And thirdly, we want to develop leadership, which is about all the communities, where leadership is a personal thing. It's not just because you're a politician or just because you're a wealthy business person, but it's because you have energy and you want to be part of what Belfast is going to become. We're therefore pushing for a new, holistic, titanic dynamic, back to our roots with a vision for the future. We're going to release energy. We need to marry city education and industry again and we need to make sparks fly. We need a city where imagination is an asset, where the power of possibility dominates, and where we have soaring ambition for our children. Now, I'm not Pollyanna, and tonight illustrates that you know, things can still go very wrong in Belfast, but they will never go back to where we were. And I believe, because we do have the, the habit now of problem solving through the peace process, that we know we can again Stop, pause, and find a way through. Roosevelt said, there is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. So much is expected of ours. We have got through the first hurdle. We have brought peace. And I'm reminded of Turin, who went through terrible times in the, last, um, in the 1990s. And they resurged with the slogan, passion lives here. Belfast, I think, now has the opportunity to demonstrate widely that passion, passion for change, for innovation, for transformation, absolutely lives here. Thank you.